This episode is sponsored by Hunt a Killer, the Blair Witch Experience. True Terror first crossed my path when, as a teenager, I secretly watched The Blair Witch Project with my best friend in the dark of the night in her living room. We experienced our first real fear through the first-person perspective of the found footage of the filmmakers. Now you can relive that thrilling suspense in real time. Combining physical artifacts that you can touch and manipulate with one of the scariest digital experiences I've ever had, Lionsgate has partnered with Hunt a Killer to bring you the immersive and interactive Blair Witch experience. Each season is made up of six boxes, or episodes, and each episode is full of realistic evidence, maps, police reports, and more. It's like a horror movie in a box, but you, and any unsuspecting friends or family you choose to bring along, are the main character. This game is sure to keep you up all night, a welcome respite and change of pace during these crazy and unprecedented times. For a little risk-taking from the safety of your own living room, see if you can survive the curse of the Blair Witch. Visit huntakiller.com slash Merck and use code Merck for 20% off your first box. Again, make sure to use the promo code Merck for a 20% discount. Robin Brooks was a 20-year-old woman who had recently moved to Rosemont, California in 1980. On April 24th of 1980, Robin finished her shift at the Donut Time shop on Kiefer Boulevard and Tally Ho Drive shortly after midnight. She stopped briefly by at a high school party, but left soon after. The last time she was seen alive was when she was walking home to her apartment. The next day, she had a swim date with a friend. Her friend knocked on her apartment door, but no one opened and she eventually left. However, when Robin failed to show up for work at 4pm at the donut shop, her friends and co-workers went to her apartment and knocked on the door numerous times. When she still didn't answer, they forced the door open, only to find Robin dead in her bedroom. An autopsy revealed that she had been sexually assaulted and stabbed multiple times. The coroner determined that she had died around 2.30am that morning. There had been no sign of forced entry, and authorities believed that the killer likely left through the window. The police were able to obtain DNA evidence from the crime scene after the killer apparently cut himself during the assault. Despite questioning multiple people, there were no clues and no suspects, so the case grew cold. In 2004, authorities developed a DNA profile of the killer from the DNA sample left at the crime scene. The DNA profile was entered into the Combined DNA Index System, also known as CODIS, but there were no matches. In early 2017, police used DNA phenotyping to determine what the killer might have looked like. The killer was determined to be an African-American male in his late 20s or early 30s. A composite sketch was made and distributed, but nothing came up. Then, on April 23rd of 2020, with the help of genetic genealogy, 71-year-old Philip Lee Wilson was arrested on suspicion of murdering the 20-year-old. Philip had been living in the same apartment complex as Robin at the time of her murder in 1980. He would have been in his early 30s at the time. He is being held at the Sacramento County Jailhouse without bail, awaiting trial. The murder of Robin Brooks was finally solved after 40 years. Nancy Doherty, a mother of two, was 38 years old and going through a transitional phase in her hometown of Chisholm, Minnesota. Chisholm is a small city in St. Louis County, and it was where Nancy had raised her daughter, along with her soon-to-be ex-husband, who was stationed in Germany with the Air National Guard. Their daughter had just graduated high school. On July 16, 1986, Nancy was brutally assaulted and strangled to death in the early morning hours in her own home. Nancy had recently gone through the process of getting a divorce, although her husband was not a suspect in this crime as he was in Germany at the time. Nancy was also about to start new job training in the Twin Cities the next day. It was just past midnight when the man she was dating dropped her off back at her home, but it wasn't until the next morning, when she failed to contact her boyfriend, that she was reported missing and police were dispatched to her home. Police conducting a welfare check the afternoon of the 16th arrived to find her body, unclothed, in her own bed with a pillowcase covering her face. With items strewn about the room, there was evidence that Nancy had put up a fight. 
Multiple samples of male semen was found both on her bed and within the victim, and epithelial cells were found underneath her fingernails. What made the crime scene more difficult to process was that Nancy had recently hosted a graduation party for one of her daughters. Because of that, there were copious amounts of both fingerprints and extra non-seminal DNA to sort through, such as epithelial cells and saliva left on rims of eating utensils or cups. However, the location in which the critical evidence was found, the male DNA, was found within and around Nancy's brutalized body, and detectives knew that that made this sample irrefutably the one of the killer. Nancy's friends and family were shocked and skeptical that this could be some random attack, and they encouraged investigators to look at all men in Nancy's life, be it casual or romantic, past or present. In addition to looking for personal connections, police canvassed the neighborhood and spoke with two young ladies who reported hearing some sort of commotion at around 3.30 a.m. One of the girls even remembered a, quote, call for help, screams, and arguing. While detectives pursued all leads, they were never able to zero in on a suspect. All search efforts were exhausted, though, and all in all, over 100 DNA samples were taken, yet none of them matched the multiple pieces of evidence found on site. The Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, the BCA, submitted Nancy's DNA to Parabon Nano Labs in early 2020 as part of a project to close cold cases using information available from public genealogy databases. Investigators knew it was a long shot, but were pleasantly surprised when Parabon Nano Labs, using the genetic lineage of the DNA sample taken from the crime scene in 1986, was matched to a close association to a local individual in the database. Using these results, Parabon Nano Labs and the BCA were able to zero in on Michael Carbo Jr. as a potential suspect. Just 18 years old at the time of the murder, Michael Carbo Jr. was now a haggard and overweight, balding 52-year-old living in a second-floor apartment in Chisholm. While investigators had a probable match from the evidence collected in 1986 and the DNA sequences in the public genealogy database, they needed to get a recent sample of the suspect's DNA in order to confirm that this truly was their guy. Using one of the oldest tricks in the book, detectives were able to obtain a sample of Michael's DNA by collecting his garbage out of a trash bag which he had thrown in a dumpster while under the watchful eye of the BCA. The DNA collected, it does not say what kind exactly or where or in what condition or what material the DNA was in when taken out of the trash bag, was matched to the seminal fluid collected from Nancy's house more than 30 years prior. Finally, in 2020, 34 years almost exactly to the date after the tragic and brutal murder of Nancy, investigators were able to breathe a sigh of relief when the DNA sequence came back as a match to Michael Carbo Jr. The man who had lived only one mile from the victim but was never regarded as a suspect or even a person of interest was finally arrested for this heinous crime. Michael had actually attended the same school as Nancy's children, but there was no indication in the charging documents about whether or not Nancy actually knew Michael, or if they had met personally. The charging documents also do not indicate whether Nancy's children knew or knew of the suspect. The police statements and press releases also do not indicate how the killer gained entrance to Nancy's home. Michael Carbo Jr. is set to be tried in January of 2021, and is currently incarcerated on $1 million bail. John Mike Kreitz lived in Aurora, Colorado. In 1992, he would move from Aurora to Helena, Montana, after buying a piece of land along Turk Road, in a rural area outside Birdseye, northwest of Helena. Mike was described as a loner, who lived with his dogs, who were part wolf, in the home that he had built himself. Mike did, however, make friends with the neighbors, Gloria and Mark Flora, who lived a little down south from him. On June 27, 2011, Gloria and Mark went to Mike's home, but they were unable to find him anywhere. His dogs were running around in the yard. Gloria and Mark immediately noticed something was wrong, as his dogs were never running loose. The next day, after not hearing from Mike, they reported him missing. A massive search began, but nothing would turn up. Police learned that Mike had been in a long-running dispute over property access and trespassing with two individuals before he'd gone missing. The first individual that he was in a dispute with was John Mahan. 
Mike lived at the end of Turk Road, and the main road ran through the property of John Mahan. John claimed that the road belonged to him and that no one had the right to go through it. John would repeatedly seek to harm Mike and his dogs. On numerous occasions, he would drive up to Mike's home when he wasn't around and would terrorize his dogs. There were several instances where John would threaten Mike with a gun. John would also block the Turk Road entrance several times and wouldn't allow Mike to cross it. Mike said that he had a legal easement to use the road when he purchased the land. Mike would record these incidents and went to the police, but they wouldn't do anything. One day, Mike recorded John pointing a gun at him. He reported this to the police and John was arrested and convicted of negligent endangerment in order to stay 1,500 feet away from Mike. The second person that had a dispute with Mike was Leon Michael Ford, an ex-military man. Leon owned property adjacent to Mike, and Leon wanted to use one of the branches of the Turk Road that passes through Mike's property. Mike had said that Leon did not have legal easement to use that road and put up a gate on that road. Leon was away in Oak Harbor at the time, and John Mahan had told three people that Leon would take care of Mike after he returns from Oak Harbor. On June 26th, after Leon returned from his trip, he asked Mike to meet him to discuss the dispute. Mike called Mark and Gloria and said that he was worried the discussion could end in violence. This was the last time anyone heard from him. CCTV footage from Mark and Gloria's property showed Leon's truck going towards and away from Mike's property on the day he went missing. Leon said that he hadn't seen Mike on June 26th and instead sprayed weeds along the road. But records show he did not rent a pole behind weed sprayer from Lewis and Clark County Weed District until the next day on June 27th. Leon changed his story and said he spent June 26th looking for booby traps with a metal detector. Despite this, police did not have enough evidence to charge him with Mike's disappearance. Both John and Leon claimed Mike ran away because of a lawsuit they supposedly filed against him. On October 5, 2011, two Forest Service workers stumbled upon dismembered remains in plastic bags on the side of East McDonald Pass. In January of 2012, the remains were confirmed to belong to Mike Crates. An autopsy found that Mike died from two gunshot wounds to the head. A few months later, his skull was found several miles away from where his body was discovered. Shortly after, John Mahan was arrested and charged with tampering with evidence after he took down the CCTV cameras that were being used in the investigation. Over the next few years, police kept investigating the case, looking for any clues or evidence. In August of 2020, police arrested and charged Leon Michael Ford with deliberate homicide and tampering with evidence. According to the court documents, the cable ties that were used to wrap the plastic bags containing Mike's remains were of a specific type that were last produced in September of 2011. The ties were only available on special orders and through specific distributors. They found that a contractor had purchased these specific ties while working at the Naval Air Station, Whidbey Island, and Leon and his wife were also working at the base at that time. Records show that Leon had taken some of these ties from a warehouse. However, the records do not list for what project Ford claimed to be using these ties for. Investigators also looked at a lab report conducted in July of 2013, which showed that the bullets retrieved from the victim's head most likely came from a 357 Magnum, a 38 Special, a 9mm Luger, or a 380 Auto firearm. In a search of Leon's Oak Harbor home the previous year, in 2012, police had seized a Ruger 357 Magnum revolver, a Colt 380 semi-automatic handgun, and a Smith & Wesson 9mm semi-automatic handgun. Leon Michael Ford is set to go on trial in February of 2021. While it may take time, police believe they have enough evidence to convict Leon for murder. Jessica Baggin was a 17-year-old teenager who lived with her parents in the small town of Sitka, Alaska. On May 3, 1996, she went to her sister's house to celebrate her 17th birthday. Jessica left her sister's house at around 1 a.m. to walk back to her home, which was about a mile away. The walk to her house should have only taken about 20 minutes, but she never arrived. Her parents waited for her, but when she did not arrive by that morning, they reported her missing to the Sitka Police Department. A massive search ensued, and her friends, family, and volunteers combed the entire path between her sister's house and her parents' house. 
However, nothing turned up for two days. Then, on May 6th, police began searching in the woods near Sheldon Jackson College campus and found the shirt that Jessica had been wearing the day she went missing. A couple of hours later, police were able to find her body about 70 feet off a bike path parallel to Sawmill Creek Road. Her body was hastily buried in a shallow grave beneath a fallen tree trunk. Her clothes and belongings were shortly found scattered in the area. An autopsy revealed that she had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. It was found that soil and leaves had been forced down her throat and that she had suffocated to death. Nine days after her body was found, a man named Richard Bingham, a janitor working at the nearby college, confessed to her murder. Despite having no physical evidence connecting him to the murder, he was charged and put on trial. Richard was a heavy drinker and would have blackouts where he wouldn't remember anything that he did during that time. Richard turned himself in, believing that he had killed Jessica during one of these episodes of blackouts. During his interrogation, he could not remember the clothes that Jessica was wearing or any of the significant details regarding the crime, such as forcing the soil and leaves down her throat. He went on trial in early 1997 and was acquitted. None of the physical evidence collected at the crime scene connected him to the crime. About 1,500 people attended Jessica's memorial on May 12th. Over the years, more than 100 people were questioned, but nothing came of it. The case remained cold for more than 20 years. Then, in February of 2019, a DNA profile of the killer was developed and was entered into public genealogy databases. By the end of the year, investigators had a new potential suspect, Stephen Branch. It was found that Stephen had been living in Sitka when Jessica was murdered and had moved to Arkansas in 2010. It was also found that Branch had previously been arrested in 1996 for sexually assaulting another teenage girl while she was jogging. He was put on trial but was acquitted in 1997. Police tried to obtain DNA from Branch from discarded items in his garbage, but they were unsuccessful. They were, however, able to obtain discarded DNA from a relative. A DNA analysis confirmed that Stephen was most likely the main suspect. On August 3, 2020, officers flew to Arkansas and interviewed Stephen. They asked him for a DNA sample, but he refused to give a sample and said that he had nothing to do with her murder. Officers then left his residence to get a warrant. Less than 30 minutes after they left his residence, Stephen shot himself in the head. An autopsy later confirmed that his DNA did match the suspect's DNA found on Jessica's body and at the crime scene. Jessica's case was finally closed after 24 years.